unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grand Tamasha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. A recent controversy involving the online news site The Wire and tech giant Meta has sparked a new debate on the role of the media in India. The recent controversy has been something of a Rorschach test, with some critics castigating digital media for playing fast and loose with the facts, and others defending the media from further intrusion by the state. The debate is far from academic. Its consequences have implications for the freedom of expression, government regulation, and democratic accountability. To discuss the state of the Indian media in the year 2022, I am joined today by the journalist Manisha Pandey. Manisha is the executive editor of News Laundry, a well-regarded digital news site that is dedicated to covering the media ecosystem in India today. She has been with the site since 2014 and has previously worked at DNA and the Business Standard. She's also the host and producer of the News Laundry show TV Nuisance, which offers a satirical look at television news in India. I am pleased to welcome her to the show for the very first time. Manisha, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Milan, for having me. So I want to ask you at the outset about News Laundry itself. You know, you've written uh, that News Laundry began its journey back in 2012 with the idea of developing a satirical kind of show that would call out the media. But, you know, in the 10 years or so since you started, it's grown into so much more than that. So for those who are kind of uninitiated, tell us a little bit about what News Laundry does and why you've decided to make the media, you know, what we call the fourth estate, the core focus of your reporting and analysis. Yeah. So actually, before I speak about what News Laundry does, I think it's probably a little important for your listeners to understand uh, the news media ecosystem in general in India, and especially with regard to the mainstream media. I became a journalist back in 2009. I joined Business Standard and the media in India, and especially mainstream media, Delhi-based media, big media, is just has been for a very long time notoriously averse to any form of self-critique. <laughs> and there's a sort of an amota code on not talking about each other. So um, there's, you know, even if you have a story with, you know, about a big newspaper, the other newspapers would probably write about it like a big daily, a Delhi-based English newspaper, blah, blah, blah. So we've always had this tradition of not uh, talking about what's happening within the media. Uh, the media can ask questions of politicians, of bureaucrats, of sports book people, of Bollywood actors, but there's been this understanding that we cannot be asked questions. So News Laundry sort of burst into the scene in 2012 to change that. And back then, I remember there was just one website called The Hoot, which was run by 79. And, and that was kind of an academic um, take on the media because they'd often really look at it through an academic lens. But then they'd also talk about stuff that's happening in the news media, things that are happening in the newsroom. And News Laundry uh, came, uh, so at that time, there was just The Hoot talking about the media. And we came in 2012. And like you said, it was the uh, the idea was to have Madhu Trehan, who's uh, founding editor of India Today, you know, who had news track, a really veteran in journalism, to do a show which would critique television news. So back in 2012 itself, we knew where this debate format was going. We knew where primetime television was going. And Madhu and Abhinandan, who's the other co-founder, they had this idea of doing a satirical show, calling out news anchors, talking about the absurdities that you see on television news. And they went, you know, from channel to channel, asking people if they'd want to host the show. And People were like, uh, are you going to talk about everyone? Are you going to take names? Are you going to name channels? You talk about all the anchors? So they were like, yeah, it's going to be like a you know a proper show where we call out everyone. So long story short, no one wanted to host that show. <laughs> and so and Madhu thought, okay, let's just start a YouTube channel of our own and we'll do a show. And that show is called Clothesline. So, and it's brilliant. I mean, your listeners should really watch. It's just amazing uh, show. And it's really interesting to look back because you were, uh, you know, we were, I'm sure we're going to talk about the state of television news, but it's interesting to look back from 2012, what was happening in the media and some of the things that we spoke about of talking heads of, you know, talk TV. And yeah, so it started with that. And then it became a full-fledged media critique website. And now, of course, we also do our own original reporting. Uh, we do ground reports. Um, and I joined in 2014 after uh, Modi came to power, in fact. And I started off as a reporter on the website. And it's quite amazing how 
uh, at least at the first two, three years when I was reporting in the media and I'd call editors or I'd call people working in newsroom, they'd just bang the phone down on me. And some of them now watch my show and like what I do. But <laughs> just to tell you how averse journalists were to taking questions and I'd often be told that we're not the story. And why are you asking us this question? And why should we tell you what's happening in our newsroom? Or why do we owe you an explanation for a particular story that we've pulled down? So it's been quite interesting to see uh, that change a little now. I think we have more and more people reporting on the media. So, so let me take you back to that place. Uh, you know, it's it's common for media, of course, to report on what business is doing, to report on what politicians are doing, to report on what civil society is doing. Why do you think it was so forbidden, in a sense, for the media to report on what the media was doing? I think some of it was just... Uh, Editors being a bit conservative, some of it wasn't, it's not just all bad faith that, oh, we'll hide all the bad stuff that we're doing. Because if there was a big story which involved, you know, uh, say an MA or anything that, you know, that involved a big journalist, you would have reports on it. But so I think part of it was just being a bit conservative that we don't talk about anyone else but ourselves. Um, and, and if there's another newspaper involved, we won't name them because. You know, people who make the news can never become news. So I think a little bit was that traditional thinking that we're journalists and we'll never let ourselves become the story. So part of it was that. And then part of it was, I think, also just convenience. You know, it's really nice to not be held accountable for <laughs> what you say, what you write. And so I think it's just this convenient pact also within editors, within like, you know, big media organizations that, okay, no one can question us. And we just, we just owe... Um, an explanation to our readers from time to time if we if there's an error or if someone you know if someone calls us out for putting erroneous information then we put out a current agenda but by and large we don't need to explain our processes to people we don't need to um, and I think one thing which really uh, stuck out to me was there's one aspect of media reporting which is you're reporting on an event you know something that's happened in the newsroom or some business related news like you said but then this other aspect of what we strongly believe in the media and uh, news laundry is that you need to know who owns your media. You know, you need to know uh, various business, um, you know, links, whether there are political links. So there has to be this sort of transparency in media ownership, which we are militantly against as an industry, you know, and that's not just a problem with traditional media, even with newer players. Uh, there's just this resistance to uh, being transparent about who owns you. And that has all kinds of sort of conflict of interest issues. So a lot of our work, at least in the beginning, was also to, to start this conversation with news consumers that, look, you need to know who's giving you your news. People who bring you your news, you need to know their political affiliations, you need to know their business affiliations, and you just need transparency and a conversation around it. I think most people still, if you just ask them in India, like, who owns Republic or what are the business, you know, any channel, any channel or newspaper, people don't know. They don't know the business or political links to most uh, media organizations. So uh, this is actually a really good segue. So I think you know most of our listeners would be aware of the influence that big business has over the media. This isn't just an India-specific story. I mean, this is a global story. Uh, but in India, the influence of business is is rather pronounced, and I think in some cases rather overt. You know, if 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 you were to sort of meet someone on the street who asked you, you know, Manisha. How do you describe the business media nexus in the year 2022? Uh, how would you characterize it? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's really, it's just the least talked about thing, I think, in India, but it's so pertinent. And, uh, you know, with the Adani, imminent Adani takeover uh, of NDTV, this conversation is even more important. And I remember that we at News Laundry actually did the first story on how there was a loan that had gone to a company linked to Reliance, to NDTV. And this was an odd loan. This was a very peculiar kind of a loan where it was interest-free and it could convert, you could convert it into equity at any point, giving you know this company linked to Reliance almost direct control of NDTV. And back then, I remember, like, we were doing the story on NDTV and people weren't happy with us, you know. <laughs> it wasn't, uh, it wasn't at all. And, you know, no one at NDTV kind of responded to the questions that we sent. So, you know, this... Traditional thinking that liberal media is all together. And liberal media can be equally averse to answering questions. And we experience that with NDTV. But uh, one of my favorite stories, at least, from 2015, just to, for your listeners to give you a very simple example, 
uh, this is a 2015 story where a young girl had been uh, five year old girl in fact had been molested by a pizza delivery boy and this was uh, this was a city story basically a delhi story and it made it to you know prominent city the uh, city pages and a prominent you know lead headline except uh, hindustan times uh, the pizza delivery boy was dominos he was from dominos but except in hindustan times it was a really small uh, column and it was uh, you know they didn't name dominos because it turns out that the family which owns hindustan times the bhartias also ran jubilant food works which runs dominos in india which has a franchise for dominos so something so simple right like if you were a reader and you picked up indian express or the hindu you got to know this you know this fairly i mean it's awful to say but sort of a routine crime story that the kind that you read but if you picked up the hindu sun times you wouldn't know of what had happened because it's a small column story and you wouldn't know that you know the pizza delivery boy was from dominos and it's because of the business links and so there are so many of such uh, cases uh, where a we have really bad disclosure practices uh, i think the right thing for a newspaper to do would be to you know either just say that okay we have interest so we're not going to report on this or you know just issue a disclaimer uh, instead of hiding it from your readers so i guess my point is to make that there is of course the big nexus with politicians owning media and much of our language press is that uh, in the states at least uh, you will have prominent political parties own a network or own cable uh, tv or own um, you know entire news channels and it's pretty clear that you know it belongs to this politician and so you're not going to see anything in that channel that's going to be averse to that politician and uh, then of course you have the problem of media owned by businessmen who have other interests right so a businessman could own a news network but could also own a solar you know energy a uh, company could also own something in infrastructure could have interest in education and so there are these little stories tucked away which if you look deeper you'd see why the, you know the story is being played out in a certain way um but most consumers of news would have no idea so you know not to shift gears too dramatically but you know just to segue a little bit more from the private sector to business and you mentioned of course there is the fact of political parties owning media outlets uh you know government of course has a variety of ways in which it can shape media narratives uh, one of the ways is by buying ads right it's one of the biggest ad buyers in the game and we know reporters of course require a certain level of access to do their work and so there are all kinds of possible quid pro quos that can come up um one of the things that gets a lot of attention is this idea of censorship by the government but it often ignores i think an even more pernicious fact which is of self censorship right and i'm wondering you know how much of the problem in today's media ecosystem as you see it is not so much about government saying you must write x y or z but reporters and editors simply not reporting the news for fear of crossing government mm it's something i often think of like is it ideology or is it just markets or is it fear of the government i think it's a mix of all these things but we do know that ads are a way in which it's the easiest way to control media so and you know there's a clear understanding among politicians that ads are a way in which we can control the media and especially in um over the last 3 years we haven't had a good time as an industry uh, there've been layoffs there's been uh, with covid there's been a cut down in ads corporate ads because that's the first thing companies do right when there's uncertainty and when people aren't buying the first hit is advertisements so a lot of um, advertising today is government dependent you know if you look at mainstream newspapers often the front page big ads are governments politicians it's either the central government or then it's state governments and you have this hilarious uh, thing where you know someone from chatisgarh uh, you know the chatisgarh chief minister will put an ad for the delhi audience the delhi chief minister will put an ad for you know the maharashtra audience and of course the central government is all over the place with modi so and it's it's a really tricky situation to my mind for uh, those who are still in the business of news so let's ignore you know the shouty screaming new news channels but let's look at the newspapers like indian express hindu times that are still committed to core values of journalism of reporting news gathering 
it's really tricky because these are large newsrooms, right? And news gathering costs a lot of money. They have bureaus, they have reporters to support. Uh, it's an extensive big show. And if you're going to be just dependent on government advertising, and you have had instances where advertisement has been cut after a story, the Hindu, after it reported, and Ram's story on Rafael, you know, there were, there were murmurs. I mean, it was never reported and proven, but they pretty much said that our ads have been stopped. And you've had that. So how does a large newsroom uh, tread its way on this issue? Because uh, you want to do journalism and you want to, you know, do your news gathering and you want to question the government of the day, but then you're also dependent on them for your survival. So it's a very, very tricky situation for those who are at least committed to core goals of journalism, like I said. Hey, Grant the Masha listeners. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Putting this show together each week is a labor of love, but it takes a lot of work to put out a great show every week. If you'd like to support the work we do at Grant the Masha, please visit ceip.org slash donate. Don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on your favorite podcasting platform, so you'll be the first to know when a new episode rolls out. So, Manisha, we've been talking about sort of traditional print and television media, but I want to ask you about digital media, because I think if you look at the landscape today, it's pretty clear that digital media in India has blossomed in a way that I think has made a lot of people quite enthusiastic that the media can do a better job of holding government and private interests uh, to account, right? But there has been a remarkable turn of events involving a prominent digital media site, The Wire and Meta, which is, of course, one of the world's most powerful tech companies. And uh, I want to sort of get your your take on this. Just to remind our listeners, uh, this saga began when The Wire published a story which claimed that Amit Malviya, who is the head of the BJP IT cell, had unilateral authority to take down posts that uh, he didn't like, basically, from Instagram, which is, of course, uh, a meta platform. Uh, the meta immediately uh, said this wasn't true. They issued uh, a, a pretty quick rebuttal. The wire sort of doubled down. Uh, this sort of s- spiral continued until finally the wire essentially ended up retracting uh, the story and 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 somewhat disowning the reporter who was involved. In fact, filing a, a police case against him for for fraud and uh, basically duping them. So I guess. I just want to ask you, you know, at a, at a kind of ma- macro level, I mean, is this a major incident? Is this a blip? Are we going to care about this two months from now? I mean, what is the significance of all of this back and forth between a leading digital media site and a leading tech company? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that this is kind of a big blow for independent digital media, even though Wired doesn't represent all of us. I mean, there are plenty of uh, you know, media organizations, and this is a mistake uh, and a pretty big one in one of them. <laughs> but I think um, the way it played out raises a lot of questions. Firstly, I think um, when you're doing an investigative report that involves the largest political party in India and one of the biggest corporations in the world, you'd expect. Uh, a news platform that's run by three very seasoned editors, one of whom uh, even, uh, you know, edited The Hindu, which is a prominent national daily at one point, to really follow due processes, uh, which it appears now pretty clearly that, uh, you know, basics weren't followed. And that's the most problematic aspect of this story, that um, you can get a story wrong, you can get your facts wrong, you can be completely misled the way they're claiming to have been. But there are still basics that you follow uh, in, you know, in any investigative story or in any uh, journalistic endeavor, which is a uh, corroboration. You know, uh, it appears that the wire didn't have enough documents in this case to support the huge, massive claim that they were making, which was essentially that Amit Malviya had gone completely rogue and had these sweeping powers that don't exist anywhere else in the world. And he could essentially take down any post at will and no questions asked. So that's a really huge claim to make. And when you make that claim, you can't just screenshot your way through it. You can't just say, hey, here's here's a screenshot. You know, uh, there should have been corroboration. There should have been basics um, 
followed in terms of checking how that document adds up, speaking to experts on whether such an internal mechanism exists or not. And we know now that the wire, you know, when it reached out to Meta, they didn't specify the details of the allegations that they were making. I think that was owed to Meta. Uh, I think Amit Malwa deserved uh, to be, uh, you know, asked, uh, sent a question and his response to the allegation that they were making against him. So those basics were not followed. And then uh, when that happens, then you open yourself up to a lot of, uh, questions on motive, on agenda, on the fact that here's a news organization that's probably just driven by its zeal to take down uh, the BJP, which is why it just ignored basic processes. And then it's very hard to make a case against that. So um, I think in that sense, it raises a lot of questions for independent media or those of us in uh, digital organizations that say that, okay, we're not influenced by corporations or we're not influenced by big government and we're trying to do journalism which is uh, fair and in public interest and when such cases like this happen then it just opens all of us to these questions and that's what happened and this incident pretty much gave um you know ready-made ammunition to the bjp because the bjp has always been saying this right about independent media that you know these guys are just driven by their hatred again for modi or these guys, you know, they don't follow due process, or they're as sort of, uh, you know, uh, biased, quote unquote, as the rest. The sad part is that the fact that the wire got the story wrong doesn't change many of the realities in India. That uh, Meta and some of its decisions concerning posts, especially those that are critical of the current government, uh, it's it's a very opaque system. And we've done so many of these stories, right? That a critical post of against Yogi Dityanath or the BJP that gets pulled down and there's no explanations as to why. What violations are they flouting? Or why does a particular post, which is a clearly, uh, you know, can be categorized as hate speech or is clearly uh, targeting a community, continues to, you know, exist on Facebook, uh, even though it, it's clearly violating community guidelines. So there is an opacity in the way Facebook functions, in the way posts are taken down. There is a very real threat to, uh, you know, journalism in India, which seeks to hold power to account. There are various ways in which governments try and, uh, and I'm, I'd say this, the government at the center and states tries to crack down on journalists. Uh, there is a shrinking space for uh, investigations on these issues in mainstream media. You don't see much of this coverage in, in a newspaper or on news channels. So uh, it is only uh, fair that, independent organizations like the Wire or the Scroll or News Laundry would want to fill that space in and do these investigations that basically go to die in the mainstream newsroom. But while doing that, uh, when such a mistake happens, then it just, you know, it, 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 it puts all of us in the spotlight in a way. I think the next steps for Wire should be um, really putting out a clear uh, report from their internal, they're, they're conducting an internal inquiry on what went wrong. So I think they owe their readers not just an apology, but an explanation on what exactly happened, what went wrong, how many pairs of eyes looked through these investigations, what are the processes that could have been followed but were ignored. Because, you know, this is also a lesson for all of us. I think it is possibly the biggest media story of the year. And the sad part is, again, that I would love to report on this story and I would love to, I would love, and News Laundry has, they put out like multiple reports on what exactly happened. But to do a deep dive investigation, you know, in the good old tradition of media reporting uh, and to really have the wire newsroom open up to us and talk to us about what really happened and not to pull them down or not to say, hey, look. Because I think there's also a bit of, uh, things can go wrong and there have been huge mistakes committed by uh, the biggest of news organizations, the next step is to really uh, fix it, review it, and issue a corrigendum and, you know, uh, explain to your readers what went wrong. Uh, you know, uh, you mentioned a couple of times the shrinking space that exists, right? That is a reality. Um, and I think for many people, even in, you know, my business of the think tank world, there's a tendency to split everything into kind of India pre-Modi, pre-2014, India post-Modi, post-2014. And of course, one of the things we tend to overlook when we do that is the fact that many of the shackles on the media, outmoded laws that stifle dissent and free expression, overreach of police, overzealous prosecutors, right? These things have a very, very long lineage. 
Um, so I guess my question to you as somebody who's living in this space, what do you think has changed since the beginning of the Modi era? Are we able to say actually things do look different today than they did, say, in 2010 or 2000? You know, before I get into that, I also want to add that even within, uh, we, we know what the central, the central government is doing. We know with cases within the BJP states, like in Uttar Pradesh, what's happening with Siddiqui Kapan, you know, he's been in jail under terror charges for simply going to a place where a crime had occurred to report on it. That's, I mean, all that we know of that. But this method, I think, of fixing journalists or journalism that you don't like by using state power, I think there's, even the state governments that are non-BGP are very happy to do that. But anyway, coming to 2014, has have things remarkably changed after 2014 or not? To me, I think the defining year is actually 2016 when the JNU sedition case happened, uh, there were a bunch of students that had sloganeered and um, these were anti-India, quote-unquote, slogans, uh, you know, slogans that were pro-Kashmir and pro-freedom in Kashmir and stuff like that. Uh, we still, to date, don't know who exactly those students were who chanted those slogans, but three students' leaders were arrested and they were charged under sedition. And at that point, I think there was a key point in Indian television news where you had anchors pretty much argue for uh, jailing of these students, arguing for the fact that if you speak anything that is against anti-India or anti-government, uh, you deserve to be in jail. And uh, I think it's been a complete downward spiral since then because forget uh, the JNU case, but instances where there have been civil protests against the government, whether it's the citizenship amendment uh, protests in the Sha in Shaheen Bagh, which was led by Muslim women, or the farmers' protests that were led by Sikh farmers mostly from Punjab, um, you had the television media actively hound these protests, public protests, actively go after the people that they're supposed to be serving. If news is a public service, then I think news anchors have pretty much taken out that component of public interest and hounded public, you know, forget asking questions of the government, they have hounded people who are asking questions of the government. Uh, you know, so to me, that's a remarkable shift. And I don't think that was so pre-2014. Remember, we had the India Against Corruption movement, which was, you know, backed by, it was a television news uh, spectacle. I don't think the scale of it would have been as big had it not received the kind of support it did from television news. No one back then was saying that these guys are anti-nationals. No one was saying that they're Naxalites or they're terrorists or they have links to Pakistan which is very common language today. It's very, very common for anchors to come on and anyone who appears to be opposed to the current government, it's very normal for an anchor to just make casual remarks to links to Pakistan or spy or anti-nationals or terrorists and stuff like that. And I think the near total, um, near total refusal to ask questions of the government on very basic issues like unemployment and price rise. This is very new. And I, you know, we had done this data story in News Laundry where we looked at debates between March and June. This is a time where, you know, newspapers are reporting on record unemployment rates. We're talking about millions of Indians exiting labor force. So we look at, you know, primetime debates across uh, major channels. And we find that between these months of March and June, there's zero debates and discussions on unemployment and inflation. Literally, I'm talking about prominent anchors like Navika Kumar, Sudhir Chaudhary, uh, you know, looking at uh, News 18, networks like News 18 India. It's remarkable between these months, zero debates on unemployment and inflation and close to 40-50 debates on Hindu-Muslim issues, Mandir Masjid issues. So the week after week, Discussing Mandir Masjid, discussing Hindu-Muslim, uh, discussing, uh, you know, various kinds of jihads that are being inflicted upon the majority community in India. This is pretty naked and unparalleled. I don't think this used to happen post-2014. Of course, there was bias. Of course, uh, channels, uh, you know, supported parties. Of course, they were soft also on the UPA. You, you know, I don't think Sonia Gandhi was ever interviewed in... Uh, the way that people want Modi to be interviewed. I think she was also giving softball questions and stuff like that. But uh, I think what has quite changed after 2014 is this complete support to the, uh, to the extent that even basic issues that impact people find no space 
on news channels today because they make the government look bad. So, uh, you know, that space, which may not be our news channels, obviously, you know, digital media has tried to fill in some of the gap, as you said. There are news reports which suggest that the, the current government is prepping a revamped uh, registration of press and periodicals bill that will include new types of regulations governing digital media specifically. How concerned are you that government will find new and creative ways essentially of muzzling digital media and preventing you from doing the kinds of investigative journalism that you're doing now? Yeah, so this is something that concerns us. And we have this organization called DigiPub, which is an association of digital publishers, digital only publishers, because I think uh, what's important is in this case, most legacy media also has digital arms. So, uh, but... Uh, they also have legacy interests to protect the truly digital ones like News Laundry, Scroll, Live Law, News Minute. So we all have formed a, a coalition of sorts to represent our issues and put forward our concerns to the INB ministry. Um, I think the biggest challenge first is when you look at uh, digital news on digital platforms, how are you going to define news? Because with a newspaper, it's simple. With television news, again, it's simple. The broadcasting, you know, you have broadcasting rights. You have a physical pub paper. But on the digital space, you know, you have a lot of YouTubers today that dabble in news. Are you going to regulate them? Uh, you know, people like Deshbhak, the channel, uh, or Dhruv Rati even. You know, they do explainers, but it's in the news space. So I think first, just defining news on digital is challenging. And it's kind of silly also to my mind because it's a very different space from legacy uh, media. So that. Uh, would remain to be seen. And when you look at some of the utterances of the government, when they speak of fake news and propaganda, again, it rarely ever encompasses the need to, you know, uh, so, you know, you'll have various BJP spokespersons or the minister making, uh, you know, speeches or making interventions saying that fake news on um, digital platforms need to be curbed. But that fake news almost always flagged by BJP and friends of BJP is mostly news that makes the government look bad. <laughs> so uh, I think it will be interesting to see what happens with this. And I hope, uh, I can only hope that the G pub and digital publishers uh, are heard because it's something that's going to impact us the most, any sort of regulation. You know, Manisha, one of the things that uh, your organization uh, and you specifically have become famous for is is the show TV Nuisance. Uh, and in it, you essentially, you know, mock the over the top sheer ridiculousness of the television news media in India. And, you know, one of the questions that I often get, and I'm sure you've heard it as well, is, you know, if the state of Indian primetime news television is so absurd, uh, why does it continue without any change or reform. And I remember asking a, a news anchor this question once, and she said privately that, you know, we're not going to change because the ratings are so good. So there's no incentive to change. And so, you know, I think in your mind, is this a supply problem or is this a demand problem? In other words, you know, if consumers are watching the stuff and giving it good ratings, uh, doesn't it make sense for the media promoters to continue doing what they're doing? So I think a, it's a very lazy and convenient argument that news that journalists or anchors like to give that, hey, you know, we are just doing this because the public wants it. Uh, and that's really akin to a, you know, uh, drug peddler saying that I'm just giving these drugs because people out there want it. You know, I'm just selling crack because people want it. <laughs> Fine. But you have a responsibility as a news professional to cater to public interest and not what the public finds interesting, you know. You have decided to be a news channel and not an entertainment channel. You have decided that you're going to do news shows and not reality TV, that you're not going to become too big boss. So the responsibility on you is to then do news, be engaging. I think every journalist wants to be heard. We want to be watched. I'm not saying that you shouldn't care about numbers or that you shouldn't care about viewership. Of course, it's very important that people listen to us, but we want to be engaging while still doing the news not turning into some sort of a comedy, you know, entertainment channel. And we're talking right now when there's a murder case in Delhi that's hit headlines. Everyone, you know, in the news, TV news business is obsessed with this gruesome tale of crime. But you have news shows with anchors with a skull, with a bone, you know, uh, showing uh, gory images, uh, you know, giving a communal turn to a crime where even the police has said that there is no communal angle to it. We are not exploring anything of that sort right now. 
so um sure this is a crime that probably has got everyone thinking and you know everyone wants to know more details but you give those details while being responsible as journalists so and look the thing about trps is also again i think i think it's very convenient when news anchor says you know the trps show that people like this kind of content there are about 40000 panel homes that measure trp so it's sampling which is fine but it is not really representative of all the tastes of uh, our indian news consumers and if you look at youtube numbers for example someone like a ravish kumar who does do the news uh, you know at least he's not going to turn up on his in his studio with a skull while talking about a murder case um he gets millions of views you know it's way more than some of the top channels a good digital news content i can speak for myself also in news laundry whatever we do there is a deep hunger among people for long form podcasts or for new shows some of the success stories in the mainstream space i think is lallan top which is an india today property uh, they're really fabulous i think they really cover uh, politics well they look at news really well without sensationalizing and just look at the numbers you know sometimes they're more than aaj tak on issues which means that there is an audience out there which is hungry for good information for good content but they just have to turn to other platforms on youtube for that and not news channels so um i just find this a lazy argument so you 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 touched on this uh, a little bit manisha but maybe this is a good way to kind of conclude the conversation you know there are lots of young people out there who every day are coming up with new ways of disrupting the digital media space right they're doing it on new sites they're doing it via apps they're doing it via social media and so for the people out there who are thinking about entering the fray you know now you're a veteran at news laundry you know what advice would you have for them are are there lessons that you've learned over the years kind of being on the front lines that you would sort of pass forward wow it's it's always really a dharam sankat quote and quote for me every time <laughs> student or you know young people want because it's it's a really hard time to be a journalist i and especially last two years i think with covid uh the job cuts the salary cuts i think most major newsrooms have had immense salary cuts um so it's a very tricky time uh economically and of course with the kind of especially if you want to be a television news journalist there are very few television news networks that will allow you to do journalism or where you can rise on the back of good old reporting uh, much of the anchoring from 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock at least is just pure theatrics so maybe like a drama student has better chances i think not <laughs> to rise up but okay let's not be too cynical Uh, i think if if journalists uh, we do need good young journalists joining the industry and being passionate about it. so i think the first thing is if you want to be a journalist you should be a complete news junkie news should excite you uh, often we come with these flowery ideas of you know we're going to write and we're going to you know prove to power and stuff it's all really nice but i think the fundamental requirement of a journalist is to be excited by news be excited by news gathering be plugged into news events which can be very taxing yeah because news is i think one of the few professions where you rarely switch off it's very hard to say okay it's a saturday sunday and now it's my time off yeah you should do it but it's hard <laughs> so i think uh, only become a journalist a if you're a complete news junkie find an organization where you uh, i think especially in today's journalism it's important the kind of industry that we have it's important to work uh, with good mentors uh, work with uh, you know newspapers that you admire or channels or even within news channel maybe an anchor that you admire a particular kind of work that you like so it's important to also have it clear in your head what kind of work you want to do so you can slowly and slowly move towards it you know so uh, be aware of the kind of mentors you maybe you may want be aware of the kind of news space that you want to work in um but this is something that my cousin told me we used to he was to work in a news channel he quit uh, i think last year when i wanted to become a journalist he said that you know uh, there are two kinds of profession one is where you have um, a lot of money but you don't have any time to spend it so like a corporate gig or then you have government jobs where you have little money but you have a lot of time on your hand to spend it <laughs> like a 9 to 5 job and in journalism you're not going to have money or time which is quite <laughs> it's pretty true that it takes a long time to make good money and it takes a long time to uh, and and time you're not going to have for yourself that's just out of the question <laughs> so so be aware of the challenges of the profession it is not 
uh, it is not this place where you can you know it's not like an you get an mba degree and then you join a big corporation and then you're earning lakhs it really takes time so persevere uh, find good mentors read good stuff uh, consume good journalism because that's the best way of becoming a good journalist yourself read good news stories follow good uh, anchors or reporters uh, read good newspapers so train yourself by consuming a lot of good journalism <laughs> My guest on the show this week is Manisha Pandey. She is the executive editor of News Laundry, and she's also the host and producer of the News Laundry show, TV Nuisance, which offers a satirical look at television news in India. Manisha, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Grant Tamasha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you download your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review to help others find the show. Tim Martin is our audio engineer and Cliff Jayapranada is our executive producer. Production assistance comes from Nitya Love. Thanks for listening and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.